seated. I would like to welcome you all to the fourth lecture of the annual William Menzies Lectureship for, night, uh, for 2023. I am glad that I can be here today because I have been out sick for the last two days, so I'm glad to be here, and at my age, I am glad to be anywhere. We are privileged today to have with us a noted scholar, and she is going to be speaking for us today, Dr. Julie Ma. Let me just uh, read you an introduction here to uh, Dr. Julie. Julie C. Ma, PhD, serves as professor of missiology and intercultural studies, Oral Roberts University, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Previously, she served as a Korean missionary in the Philippines from 1981 to 2006 and as research tutor of missiology at Oxford Center for Mission Studies, Oxford, UK. Publications include When the Spirit Meets the Spirits, Pentecostal Ministry Among the Kankanai Tribe of, in the Philippines, Mission Possible, Biblical Strategies in Reaching the Lost, uh, which is out in a second edition, and numerous articles published in different journals. She also contributed articles to collected works in different books and in dictionaries and encyclopedias. She has numerous paper presentations. A couple of cases are on Pentecostal education at a parallel session at the Edinburgh uh, Centenary Celebration, Edinburgh, 2010, and on the role of the Holy Spirit and mission as one of the keynote speakers at the Asian CMS Launch Conference, Oxford, UK, in 2014. She served as the General Council Member and Executive Committee Member of Edinburgh in 2010. 
She served as the president of the Asian Pentecostal Society from 2008 to 2010. She is serving on the executive committee, participating reference for the centennial celebration of the International Missionary Council from 2021 to 2023. When we came here in 2001, of course, Wan Suk and Julie Ma were here as faculty members. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ed Wan Suk was academic deed. And it was so wonderful the way they welcomed us, they w the way they helped us uh, get integrated into the culture here in the Philippines and at APTS. And so they both mean very much to my wife, Dickie, and me. And it's a pleasure today to turn the uh, pulpit to Dr. Julie Ma. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a great, it's a great joy to come back to APDS, where I grew spiritually and intellectually. And I like to express my thanks uh, to Reverend Taman Lee, the president, and uh, Dr. Jun Kim, the academic dean, for their kind invitation to speak at the annual lectureship. Today, I'm going to lecture on the holistic mission of a Pentecostal church, tracing back the history of the Pentecostal movement. We can find uh, there are people who experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the Ajusa revival meeting from 1906 to 1908, went out to different parts of the world to preach the gospel. They just committed to mission work, although they didn't have adequate support. They went out with eagerness and the passion to bring souls to Christ. Hence, I strongly believe that Pentecostal mission is a combination of traditional, traditional mission, uh, preaching the gospel, and holistic mission. Okay, let me present my paper. Okay. I believe that the profile of flavor of my presentation is different from Dr. Won Suk Ma, my husband. Okay. You understand what I mean as I read through my paper. Topic is the holistic ministry of the Pentecostal Church through the empowerment Holy Spirit. Pentecostals sharing the gospel for saving souls is accomplished through the evangelistic mission. The mission is assumed in its furthermost direct way as a facilitating God's power to witness to the ends of the earth. The Pentecostal movement shares this stereo, stereological driven mission as the evangelization of the lost. Through the repentance, people believe that their sins are washed by the blood of Jesus and that they become the children of God. The Pentecostal gospel of salvation along with hope and Optimism is particularly well accepted by people in destitute, socially marginalized situations and the sick. This paper will discuss the Pentecostal gospel, Pentecostal evangelistic mission, along with the holistic mission, biblical text, such as baptism of the Holy Spirit, to be witness. Jesus' ministry by the anointing of the Spirit, gift of the Spirit, Spirit empowered the mission and uh, further transforming life after conversion. I start uh, with a biblical text. 
This section presents several main tenets of Pentecostalism by studying two passages from Acts, one from the Gospel, and one from Paul's letter. They have also been popular passages among Pentecostal believers. <clears throat> okay, the Pentecostal of the Spirit to be witnesses from Acts 1.8 uh, and uh, Acts 2.1-12. There is a close connection between Acts 1-8 and 2, 1 to 12. The book of Acts reveals the expectation and the experience of the early church with the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This declaration is both a command and a promise. The disciples have to wait to receive power through the Holy Spirit to accomplish their calling as witnesses to the risen Messiah. The calling of Christ and the calling of the disciples are inseparably related by means of the Holy Spirit as the anointing upon Christ is to be transferred to the disciples and the ecclesia. 1, 4, X1, 4. X1, clarifies that the coming of the Holy Spirit is for missional empowerment in terms of being witnesses, which I will illustrate later. In Luke chapter 24, verse 47, Jesus specifies that the order of scriptural prophecy includes the future mission of the church and the repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at the Jerusalem. I skipped the uh, next uh, paragraph. I move next page. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 indicates the 120 disciples were all together in one place, expecting the fulfillment of the Lord's promise in 1.8. It is not certain if this is the identical location as the upper room in which the Last Supper was eaten. It might have been in the upper city next to the temple. And the following uh, uh, paragraphs is a description of the Spirit coming upon people. Verse 2 presents the Spirit coming like a powerful wind from heaven and covering the house. Luke starts to use a sequence of analogies to delineate what is occurring like a wind, a fire, and the tongues. It is the sound that permeates the house, not the wind as such. The Spirit's presence is increased in the gathering place. Noticeably, the idea of coming from heaven means a transcendent and by implication driven origin by the statement also uses the notion of space from up there to down here. The Spirit comes upon people from outside of them, and yet the Spirit is also imminent within them, breathing life and vivacity into them. There are echoes of earlier biblical texts where the Spirit of God is related to the breath of life. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, as well as a theophanies where God's presence is understood to have come down from heaven, the place where God dwells in his majesty and splendor. Verse 4 reports that all of them are filled with the Holy Spirit, that is the indwelling spirit. The verb used here, an er errorist, passive, form of uh, Greek words uh, pimplemi means they were filled. 
using a variety of liquid type metaphors to describe the spirit coming upon people, filling, baptizing, and pouring. Witherington observes that Luke uses them interchangeably, although he avoids the verb to baptize for the subsequent narratives of the Spirit's advance. When the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they all speak in tongues of diverse languages. God supernaturally empowered them through the Holy Spirit to speak the language without the necessity to acquire them first. The linking between the radical experience of tongues and the mission is clear. Thus, the early Pentecostals thought of the tongues as a missionary language. But this idea was soon abandoned. Nonetheless, Luke's narrative use of tongues was also mission connected. And this is something that the Pentecostals need to develop. Luke also pays attention to the Spirit's power for the mission, especially the prophetic dimension of the Spirit's activity. And this power for mission includes the cross-cultural element at the core of the Pentecostal theology of a pneumato ethnic mission, I mean, pneumatocentric mission, is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit of for witnessing. I move to the next section. And Jesus' ministry by anointing of the Spirit. It's from the uh, book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 18 to 19. And Luke's gospel stresses Jesus' unique relationship with the Holy Spirit by presenting him as the Spirit-filled Messiah, equipped to carry out God's plan for salvation. His public declaration of the messianic mission takes place in his teaching upon the request of the leaders of hometown synagogue. After the reading of a Isaiahic passage, the people in the synagogue exhibit strong expectations as they wait for additional consensual. While some may speak of the ensuing moment of Jesus' inaugural speech, Luke does not record an official discourse, but simply the reading followed by Jesus' announcement that this scripture finds its fulfillment at that very moment in the hearing of those in the synagogue. Luke chapter 4, 21. He is the one ensured in the prophecy that through him God will save his people. He will indeed be God's mediator of salvation through his ministry. The declaration, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, Luke chapter 4, 18, is an unmistakable reference to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 2, and uh, chapter 58, verse 6. By bringing these two prophecies together, he calls himself anointed with the Spirit of God and uh, bravely declares his messiahship. The Spirit is on Jesus, who will bring God's salvation in a five-fold manner through God's anointing. First, to preach good news to the poor, and second, to proclaim release to the prisoners, and third, to proclaim recovery of sight for the blind, and fourth, to set the oppressed free, fifth, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Luke anticipates in the account of Jesus' ministry, explicit, explicitly hope to the poor, freedom to captives, a sight to the blind, and the deliverance to the oppressed. The spirit led and the empowered Jesus proclaims this prophetic promise and brings it into realization. And move to the next section. People in the context 
the poor and the marginalized. <laughs> Along with the stress on spirit-empowered evangelism and the healing, Pentecostals utilize a holistic mission in which the gospel is the remedy for social issues, such as the plight of orphans and widows, the HIV AIDS epidemic, and the like. Responding to human suffering has significantly broadened the purview of a Pentecostal mission from a focus on saving the lost to a mission to the poor and the destitute. With such a notion, nearly from its inception, Pentecostal beliefs and the practices have shown a specific appeal to the deprived and the socially marginalized and the social issues in society. The assurance of good health and blessing reconstituted the understanding of Christian redemption to individuals, families, communities, and the here and now. The message is ready to tackle life unrelenting problems such as sickness, shortage, and job loss, loneliness, and disaster. As the faith closely interacts with a given context, it tends to be elastic, quick to reinterpret and expand the existing beliefs to counter a new challenge. This makes the Pentecostal faith extremely agile, relevant, and dynamic in the socio-cultural context. In various East and Southeast Asian countries, the Pentecostal beliefs, believers form an alternative social movement addressing so society's common challenges. As a result, Pentecostal Christianity has recorded significant growth over many decades throughout the world. As expected, the Pentecostal notion of the mission is integral and holistic with the evangelistic mission as the ultimate outcome nonetheless. A few Pentecostal missionary practice such as teen challenge reveal theological rationality in dealing with the impoverished, in this case, drug addicts in urban centers. There was a simple theological logic. As the current state of human transgression started from rebellion against God, its undoing will have to begin with a spiritual realm of human existence. In Latin America, the Pentecostal faith has uh, produced a socio, social upward mobility among its followers, and this has attracted many to its faith. And now I'd like to show PowerPoint slides of people who, are, who have been involved in holistic mission. Okay, first one is Ethiopia Orphanage Mission. Lillian Treasure, many of you know this uh, lady. In 1915, her orphanage started with a few children, and by 1916, it had grown to 50. Her e Egyptians called her Mama Lillian. Mama Lillian, old mother of the Nile. And she passed away in December 17, 1961, and the Egyptian government honored her for her dedication to community service. She cared for over 20,000 children and widows in total over 50 years at an orphanage in Ashot, Egypt. Yeah, this is when she was very young, maybe about to leave for, you know, Egypt. And yeah. And after 50 years, how different she become, became. Very old. But she surrounded many, many children. She loved the children so much. And next one, HIV AIDS intervention and care and the Nazareth Project, care for street children in Zambia. Joshua Banda, senior pastor of the North Mid Assemblies of God in Lusaka, Zambia, began ministering to 
HIV AIDS patients and their families in 1992. And this is man, Joshua Banda. Yeah. Uh, I will actually uh, present these two persons, uh, Lillian Treasure and Joshua Banda, in details in my paper. Okay, next. Next, Teen Challenge, started in 1961 by David Wickerson. Over 200 drug addicts, alcohol, alcoholics, and the gangsters came to a program called the Teen Challenge to experience the drinking and the drugs and become new people in Christ. It's a, if you hear people's, this, this young teenager's testimony, you cannot believe. Amazing, amazing. And this is the man, David Wilkerson. And the ministry started in earliest prayer after being shocked by the murder of seven teenage boys on the streets of New York and watching the lives of gangsters. And Teen Challenge ministers, ministers to over 200 locations in the United States and over 1,000 locations around the world. Marvelous. The next one, child care in Latin America. Latin American child care was started in Chile in 1961 by an American missionary named John Bueno. And John Bueno founded the school knowing that 50% of the children had, to ch uh, chance, had no chance of getting an education. And he saw that children are malnourished and have no access to health care and uh, many are left out. In 1973, 300 students were given the opportunity to be educated with launch of an educational program by satellite. And this is man, John Bueno. And the fifth one, female education, Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso has a low rate of sending girls to school Maybe many Asian countries are the same. You know, they just uh, consider boy is better than girl, and uh, you boys n need to receive more education, more opportunity. But girls, you do all the house chores, taking care of your brothers and sisters. And you know, I have seen a lot like that. But Burkina Faso the same. Pastor Philip decided to do the work of educating girls. Philip started this educational program in 1921 with a Harold John, who was sent from the Full Gospel Church, so he was a missionary. He did not stop at the teaching, but also preached Jesus. It is not easy to spread the gospel because Burkina Faso is a Muslim country, so 90% of population is a Muslim. And however, parents who could not afford to go to school in Muslim families sent them to this educational program, and the children naturally heard the gospel. Between 2012 and 2015, 342 children accepted the Lord. A few years later, even boys who could not go to school were given the opportunity to be educated. As time passed, more and more children accepted the Lord, and the parents also came to the Lord. The number reached 5,000. Amazing. Yeah. Through education, the source, you know, in the darkness added God's kingdom. And Philip was even given an award of merit by the president of the country. And the sixth feeding program, feeding ministry, and hospital ministry, education ministry in Calcutta, India. Mark Buntain, many of you know this man. He's, uh, I deeply admire him and his wife, Hulda uh, Buntain as well. And uh, started this ministry in 1954. And Calcutta looked like a hopeless city. And uh, close to 2 million people lived in this city. And 80% of people are poor. And there were many hopeless homeless people and the street children. And one day, you read this very carefully, one day while worshiping at the church, a beggar came, comes in and shouted, Preacher, feed our hungry stomachs and tell him that the God in heaven 
loves us. And so Mark Bunting shocked after hearing this. And many children died out of starvation, and not only children, but also adults suffered from hunger and hardships. When Bontain heard the child's cry, he was challenged, and he started the feeding program. And it was a small number at the first, but gradually increased, feeding 10,000 10, meals a day, and feeding every single day. And Bontain built a school. There are currently 102 schools where 32,000 young people are being educated. And in 1971, the hospital was established. And currently, 40,000 patients are being treated through this hospital uh, free of charge. So can you move back? Uh, the, yeah, here. So he started a feeding program. It not only 1,000, 2,000, but 10,000 a day. And also, he found that uh, you know, the young, young people, no, no chance for education. So he started the education program. And that what is next? Hospital. And many people are dying. So I tell you, <laughs> so there's no much money you know, to, to run all different ministries with a prayer. They always nail down before God. Lord, you are the source. You are the, the one who provides needs. And God faithfully provided all their needs. Praise God. I, is, is it last one? So this is a, the se seventh, right? Okay, th thank you. So let me uh, move next. The orphanage mission in Ethiopia, as I showed briefly in here. <laughs> Lillian Treasure, an American Pentecostal missionary in Egypt from 1910, to 1961 served Egyptian children after breaking her engagement to answer God's call. So you may wonder why she broke up the engagement. It is better for them to go together after getting married, you know? But uh, I assume that maybe she thought it is much better going by herself alone so that she can really co concentrate, concentrate on God's mission rather than going with us, someone else. So I try to understand that way. And Tricia had a strong desire to begin an orphanage, even though there was a needed support, no committed supporters. In 1915, her orphanage began with several children which grew to 50 children by 1916. With this rapid growth, the adequate resources to support them and the secure a large house were critical because more children coming, so more space needed. To solve this acute challenge, she came up with a creative idea to make bricks utilizing the labor force of children. So what she did was the older boys you know, let all the boys learn how to make bricks from the expert. Because hiring, you know, the, the people to make uh, bricks is so costly. So that all the children learn the bricks, and it turned out beautifully. I mean, good piece of uh, bricks, <laughs> so they can, you know, build the buildings. Uh, feeding program. Soon feeding programs were added, and by 1941, she served 2,700 meals every day. In the 1960s, her orphanage housed 1,500 children, and she served 4,500 meals each day on a campus that contained more than 11 buildings. I don't know how she built these 11 buildings, because she, she had nothing, literally nothing. Every day, she lived by faith when I read her book. And she prayed, Lord, please provide my need. But surprisingly, sometimes local people, you know, brought some money, gave her, gave her. And as unexpected people in USA, church members sent money. That's the way how she lived. And in addition, 
Treasure provided housing for widows who no place to live after the death of their husbands. She dedicated most of her adult life, 50 years to be exact, to take care of children and women in Egypt. Besides providing physical necessity, she also cared for the spiritual growth of a person, of the children and the widows who came to treasure for care. Some were believer, believers, but others were not. Hence, she constantly looked over their spiritual growth. And for those who were uncertain of the salvation of Christ, she made it her goal to bring them to salvation. Egyptians affectionately recognized her as a Mama Lillian or Mother of the Nile. She passed away on December 17, 1961, and the Egyptian government honored her for her dedication to social services, looking after 20,000 children and the widows at the orphanage for over 50 years in ancient Egypt. The orphanage has continued its work even after her passing, providing new life to countless children. Many children were trained in Christian education throughout the orphanage's 100 years of operation. Presently, presently it is one of the biggest and the best orphanages in the world. <clears throat> Next one, HIV AIDS intervention and the care and the Nazareth Project Care for Street Children in Zambia. And this Nazareth Project Care for Children, Street Children in Zambia is a social care program of uh, Joshua Banda. Since 1992, Joshua Banda, the senior pastor of North Mid Assembly of God Church in Lusaka, Zambia has been involved in a holistic ministry providing care for HIV AIDS patients and their family. He was very aware that the uh, church's response to this pandemic had to be holistic, encompassing spiritual, medical, educational, and social and the community care. Actually, when we were at the Oxford Center for Mission Studies, um, uh, Many years ago, it has been yeah about ten years ago. Uh, I think he was a student, and later she completed her PhD and invited us, and we went to his church. And my husband preached on Sunday. The members around the, over three thousand members, and afterward he took us to different places like a circle of hope. I'm going to, you know, uh, present it later, and uh, and uh, uh, what is street children, children's home, and uh, other places. Uh, it was amazing. It's so wow. He's a great man, you know. As a nation, Zambia's future was uh, bleakly caused by the rising of AIDS infection, according to a 2011 UNICEF report. AIDS patients in Zambia consisted of 337,316 adults and 43,625 other children. It became an urgent concern for the government and the social sectors. The Circle of Hope was created in September 2005 to provide a Christian based deterrence and holistic care for HIV AIDS uh, patients, offering free antiretroviral treatment and education for their families. A willingness to be tested is the most essential and hardship first step for AIDS intervention, and the Christian clinics such as Circle of Hope achieve the high test rate you know why? Because they are patient, HIV AIDS patient, but they are ashamed of let people know them. They are uh, HIV patient, so they, they, they keep themselves. There's no then there's no way to be cured, right? So that has been ongoing problem in this country. Even some members in the church are uh, HIV AIDS patient. He knew that, so it was heartbroken, you know, 
experience for him. And it's a, that is a, one of the critical reasons why he started uh, the Circle of Hope. The Healthcare Association of Zambia, to which Banda's North Mid Assemblies program belongs, accounts for over 50% of healthcare provision in the nation. Christian involvement in HIV AIDS epidemic by local congregations has left a considerable influence on society. As a consequence, Banda was invited to lead the National AIDS Council in 2007. In 1999, Banda began a program to care for children, street children, most of whom were AIDS patients. I mean, AIDS orphans. Other works also followed. The Nazareth Project is a new social care program of the church. It runs holistic care for orphaned and vulnerable children. As time passed, the Nazareth Project advanced into a community of 70 former street children, providing its own housing with a 40-acre farm to date, almost 1,000 1, orphaned and vulnerable children have gone through its training with astonishing stories of transformation. Besides running the Nazareth Project, Banda never neglect to share the goodness of Jesus Christ. And I like to skip uh, uh, the gift of spirit from First Corinthians chapter. Uh, 12 verses 7 to 9 because we all know gift of spirit very well so I, I want also for time's sake I like to move the next section response to the gospel the spirit empowered and mission the beginning decades the beginning decades of the Pentecostal movement were marked by dedicated and the passionate mission activities from 1906 to 1908 Pentecostal missionaries, after experiencing the spirit baptism, believed that spirit empowered them for the mission committed to the life witnessing. They disposed of their possessions and left for the land of God's call. They reached far-flung corners of the earth to accomplish the great commission, and no sacrifice seemed too enormous for them to, to proclaim the gospel Okay, let me read this part. Vincent Sinan called them missionary of the one-way ticket with a few valuable instances. They, this army of fully dedicated missionaries did not expect to come back home in their lifetime, but to work to end their lives in mission field. And I like to uh, go to... Uh, Next section, I skip some of them. Uh, life, uh, uh, live a life worthy of the gospel, transforming life after conversion. In this section, I'm going to talk about the tribal group of people, the Kankanais, who transformed after converted to Christ. Um, during our teaching at the APTS, we are involved in ministry among the Kankanai tribe. It was 1996 to 2006 for 10 years. But we came here much earlier, 1979. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, their religious belief and the practices. And they are ancestor worshipers. They believe ancestor spirit obtained power to bless and to heal and to bring lux to their family and also community. In order for them to experience the uh, ancestor spirit's power, they have to bring sacrifice. You know, they butcher pigs and cows and uh, for poor people, uh, chickens. But there is a kind of a rule. When you kill uh, 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 two pigs, two pigs uh, at the first time, next time four and six and eight, going even number. But when you kill one at the first time, next what? Three, five, seven. It's a huge money you need to buy this amount of 
topics. So they borrow money from either their friends or relatives who can afford to lend money to them. But it takes ages to pay back entire money because they, they, have, they do not have cash income. They are simply farmers. You know, they are indeed in the bondage of darkness. But there came the gospel of salvation from the missionary and the local pastor. And what they did was they held a revival meeting in different mountain provinces. During revival meeting, great and huge miracle took place. It was like a book of eggs. The goiter in the neck gradually disappeared while being prayed. And that the lame could walk, and the blind opened their eyes. And this Kankanai attended this revival meeting, I witnessed with their naked eyes. And they themselves experienced God's power. So they turned to Christ in total respect. They no longer worshipped uh, ancestor spirit. And they, did, they didn't bring uh, sacrifice to their spirit. Praise God. So let me just uh, uh, briefly read here. Many people who lived in societies where practices of spiritism and the shamanism are prevalent uh, are convert to Christ through healing experiences that change their lives. Experiencing physical healing helps them realize that the power of Christian God is greater than the God's whom they regularly worshipped and to whom they brought sacrifices, often for the decades when they had physical problems. The fact is that their gods couldn't heal the sick, but the Christian God healed when someone prayed. Since such experiences, their mind and thought were completely changed and further their way of life transformed, no longer seeking their gods' aid, but drawing to the one true God for help. Okay. A tribal group of people named the Kankanais in the northern Philippines believed that keeping ancestor worship was crucial because the ancestor spirit was a source of healing and blessing in their lives. They were taught that ancestor worship should be passed. One gener should, should be passed from one generation to the next. Hence, they must keep ancestor spirit at the same time. Though they have such a strong fear that if they do not worship the spirits of the ancestor any longer and discover a new god or spirit, the ancestor spirits will get angry and bring punishment upon them. However, after they converted to Christ through the supernatural experience of healing, they completely turned to Christ. They no longer lived in fear, fear but found the comfort and the peace in God. There was a complete transformation of their minds and their lives. And let me conclude my paper. Pentecostals have a great passion for God's mission and for the fulfillment of the Great Commission after being empowered by the Spirit. And many missionaries went to the mission field by faith, believing that God would provide for their needs. The Pentecostal cross-cultural workers proclaim the gospel and their work has been well accepted by non-Westerners due to their similar worldviews, especially in the spirit world. It is also noted that Pentecostals have excelled in proclaiming and demonstrating God's miraculous work of healing today as a vital component of the mission. Signs and wonders can affirm the message of God's salvation. And Pentecostals have particularly appealed to the grassroots population, the poor and the marginalized in society. With the supernatural power of God, on the, on the one hand, they also practiced holistic ministry. As discussed in the earlier part of this paper, they started orphanage and provided education and building hospitals and HIV, helped HIV patient. And their own root of social marginalization makes them passionate about caring for the neglected, abandoned, and destitute. 
such ministries are motivated by God's love and conviction through the demonstration of God's power and the caring for the needy. The ultimate goal of the Pentecostal mission has been the spiritual conversion to bring people to God's kingdom. Thus, it is imperative for Pentecostal believers and the churches to continue and strengthen their inheritance, which distinguished the movement in the extension of God's kingdom by bringing souls to Christ. While the advancement of a Pentecostal scholarship is encouraging, it should also preserve and strengthen the grassroots spirituality and the mission empowerment on the level of daily life and the engagement. This includes a passion for the poor and the marginalized. And listen to this line carefully. The combination of the their spiritual empowerment and the heart for the suffering make their gospel the full gospel. And they are poised to influence and lead the Christian mission in the coming of decades. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Julima, for the wonderful lecture. Let's just give her one more hand, sister. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. you may be seated. Well, actually, I'm really glad to do this today. Uh, as we planned, we really want to have a group discussion. So the reason why I'm standing here because uh, what we are going to do right now is a little bit complicated. We have a lot of people sitting here. Uh, so we have 80 people joining the lectureship online. I'm glad that we have about six faculty members who are joining the faculty, I mean, the, the lectureship online. So we are going to put you, those who are joining the lectureship online, into the break rooms right now. So we are going to have a very short break, about five minutes. So during this five minute break, you can just feel free to go out and write your questions. So after the group discussion, we are going to have a short Q&A session as well. So, um, from now on, you have about three minutes, okay, to write your question, and then uh, before we do it, may I ask all the faculty members, APTS faculty members, to stand up, please, who are attending our lectureship. Faculty members, I need you to be spread out, okay, so that our people here can join you. Okay, on the right side, Dr. Duaren, would you like to come to this side and then I can see that um, Sister Elabaya, would you like to come over this side, please? Okay, and then it's good. Dr. Galen is here in the middle, Dr. William and Dr. Diana, you can go back there. Uh, we have uh, a lot. Let's just put Dr. Dave Johnson in the middle. Okay, just would you go to the middle? All right, so we have uh, Debbie and Claudia and then Dr. Um, Reverend Everett. Okay, so would you just uh, stand there and then just uh, choose whatever, I mean, whoever you like, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, maybe in the begin, in, the, in front, um, Reverend uh, Tamwan, yes, here. And then Darren, just go back there, okay? And then here, yeah, so we are ready. So we have one question here to answer. All right, what are the principles to effectively support a holistic approach to a mission? And what should be the characteristics of people who are involved in a holistic mission? All right, so we have only one question and then you have just 10 minutes to discuss this big question. All right, so just enjoy the group discussion and then we will have you back. All right, those who are joining the lectureship online, don't panic even if we are going to pull you out of the break room. Just understand that this is the time for us to go back to the Q&A session. All right, we have a two minutes break, please. So we have um, maybe 10 groups with eight members.
and uh, APT faculty members who are joining the lectureship online, please feel free to lead group discussions. If you cannot find any APTS faculty in your group, especially those who are joining online, please feel free to lead the group discussion without the faculty member. All right, uh, if you are ready, please just uh, start the discussion right now. I will give you 10 minutes, okay? All right, and then if you have any questions for Dr. Julima, please write it and bring it to Dr. Galen Hartor. Okay, please go ahead.
seems like we are enjoying the group discussions. So I will give you five more minutes, okay? Five minutes. All right, time's up, so we don't have enough time. So Dr. Galen Hurtu will come and um, chair the Q&A session. If I'm not mistaken, we have two questions so far. If we have, maybe we can have one more, okay? Please go back to your seat. Thank you. If we have a question, please bring it to Dr. Galen Hurtwig. We have already two. We may have one more. 
So first come and first served. <laughs> okay, so what about the people joining online? Are they all back? All right, good, good. I hope you had a really interesting and meaningful discussion. So back to Dr. Galen Hartwick. Thank you, Dr. Jun. All right, we have a few questions here. Uh, please write down your questions, bring them up to me, and I'm going to be standing right over here uh, as Dr. Julie is answering, and uh, just, just hand them to me. All right, Dr. Julie, this is the first question. <clears throat> At Azusa Street, they thought that, quote, speaking in tongues meant they could go anywhere and preach the gospel in a language they had not studied and the people would understand. Is that what you meant when you said that at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they thought that speaking in tongues was a missionary language? Uh, initially, yes. They thought uh, the speaking lang language related to mission work. So when you speak in tongues, then you, are, you have to go for the mission work. But they found out, soon they found out that it's not correct understanding. Misunderstanding, yes. All right. Thank you. And the second question. I am anticipating the third. All right. Many foreigners from far-flung places were in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. Is that how and why the gospel spread to far-flung places in the first and second centuries. And this, this question comes from someone from the United States and China. Oh, okay. Um, uh, in 1X8, you all know this uh, verse very well. When you are experienced or empowered by the Holy Spirit, you have to go out, preach the gospel, start from Jerusalem and Samaria, Judea, to the ends of the earth. So gathering among themselves, the 120 people, you know, they already heard this from, from Jesus Christ because he told his disciples, and the disciples might have told the gathering place, you know. So, uh, yes, experiencing of the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit is a closely connected with the mission, going out, not only first the second century, but until Jesus comes. All right. Now and forever. <laughs> you know, I, I find something interesting, if I can just in, interject something. I read books, and they say on Paul's second missionary journey, when he got the Macedonian vision, and he went to Macedonia, they say that is the first time the gospel went to Europe. But you know, on Pentecost, there were people there from Rome. And the church in Rome had been established long before Paul went to Macedonia. So you can just correct some of your books there when you read that. Um, it was already there from people on the day of Pentecost. Okay, we have an, another question from Dr. Dave Johnson. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, just a question. I'm, I'm interested in the nexus be, of a spiritual power um, that we find in animistic practices like among the Kankanai and the power of the Holy Spirit um, uh, that we see so demonstrated in, in, in our churches. My question is, years ago, uh, Jaime Buletao uh, articulated the concept of a split-level Christianity where people give allegiance to, say, the doctrines of the Catholic Church, but also continue their animistic practices. Uh, I, think, uh, I think Charles Kraft called it dual allegiance to both systems of thought. Do you see that um, continuing among the Kankanai, or could we say that the, the split uh, or the, the split level Christianity is not as strong among Pentecostals as it might be among Catholics or other groups? Well, that is a very, uh, very serious question. Uh, <laughs> yes, there are some people who 
who converted to Christ from their animistic pra practice may make dual allegiance initially, initially, because they need some time of uh, uh, training to understand God, who God is, who the Holy Spirit is. Because they are raw Christians, they know nothing about God. So sometimes they attend the ritual practice uh, performance and also attend the church service. So we can call syncretism, syncretized Christian. But the role of church is very important. They have to give kind of teaching session, you know. So after maybe a few months of teaching about, uh, systematically teaching about who God is and the salvation of Christ, the role of Holy Spirit, and uh, make a clear allegiance to Christ is so important, then they will make a total turn to Christ. But initially, yes, but we have to allow them. You cannot force that is wrong. Poor, you have to, you should not go. Yeah, it takes time for my understanding. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Julie. I guess that is our last question. Uh, have you enjoyed her presentation today? Yeah. Let's show her. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, you had your group discussions. And I hope that you really enjoyed those. Is there one group who would like to share with us any conclusions that you came to in your discussion? We'll take just a minute now. Any groups? Yes, back here. All right, Dr. Darren said we need a holy imagination to try things that have never been done before and see if the Holy Spirit will bless it. All right, good. Uh, any other groups here that would like to share? Now, wherever the, oh, here, okay, Dave Johnson. We, we, we spent most of the time talking about um, uh, the characteristics of the people involved in holistic ministry, and I think we came up with three. One is that you have to stay a long time. You know, Mark and Aldo Buntain were there in, oh, Mark Buntain was in Calcutta for 35 years. Uh, Lily and Trash are 50 years. You have to stay for the long haul. You have to have the character to be able to stay for the long haul. The other thing was uh, resourcefulness, uh, finding ways, yes, prayer, but also finding ways like the Trillion uh, Trash Orphanage, I think, is mainly supported through their own livelihood projects or other indigenous sources. Um, and what was the last one? There was a third one I can't remember now. Um, <laughs> but. Um, my aging brain. So, um, so those are a couple of the characteristics that we found in the people. Um, and again, there was one more, and I don't remember what it was. All right, thank you. Speaking of Lillian Trasher, could I just share something personal? When I was a kid, Lillian Trasher was in our home, and I have a picture of her at our dining room table. So that was something really special. I think one characteristic of a person would be compassion. You've got to care. If you don't care, you're not going to get involved. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for your input here. Let me just give a couple of announcements. Uh, this afternoon, there will be a paper pres presentation by Cho Tang at 3 p.m. at the Hearst Chapel on cessationism debate. Hey, you will want to be here for that. And then the last lecture is tomorrow at 11 a.m. on Asian Pentecostals in Global Churches Together. And that will be by Dr. Juan Sukma. All right. Well, thank you all. Let us stand. 
and let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together. Thank you for people like Dr. Julie who have put in the time and effort, not only in study, but also in practical engagement and have paved the way for us who are interested. Lord, we thank you that you are at work in our world and that you use people like us to do that work. Lord, I pray that there would be those here today who would hear the voice of the Spirit saying, go, go, spread the gospel. Lord, work in a mighty way among us, we pray. Lord, we pray that you would watch over us each one as we go our separate ways and bring us back tomorrow with joy in our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Um, just a minute. Uh, I think uh, uh, I asked for permission from the dean. Uh, perhaps he has forgotten about this. Every year it has been our practice, my wife and I, since we came here, to bless you over the Chinese New Year. Uh, when I became a Christian as a young boy, the pressure was on me. Uh, the, the persecution excuse was I have followed a Western religion, uh, that I have forsaken my own culture and my own people. And a lot of you have faced that kind of accusation. Uh, and as I grow up, I'm determined that I preserve the good elements of my own culture, that my Christianity is not North American Christianity, and I didn't believe in a North American God. And so this Chinese New Year, we'd like to bless you with our Ang Pao again. Uh, the Chinese have all kinds of blessings for Chinese New Year. For example, blessing as big, as wide as the Eastern Sea, and life as long as the Southern Mountains. <laughs> uh, so I want to bless you, my wife and I want to bless you. And we believe as we pray for you, they are all stored up in God's throne room, and the time will come when God remembers all these prayers. So this is not just a, some money, although there is money inside, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a spiritual blessing as well. Uh, so as we, as we talk about uh, uh, global Christianity, we must understand that it's only practical when there is a local context. Uh, so uh, here we are with this local context, truly Asian Christianity. And as I pray for you, I want you to remain where the Lord has called you and be faithful. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to bless this community. Here might be just a token or a symbol, but there is a reality behind every token and symbol. And the reality is you hear our prayers. You bless us. You are a good God. And so I pray for blessings upon each one of my brothers and sisters here. Release us, O oh Lord, into a life of blessing so that we can be a blessing to others. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So my wife and I will stand somewhere near the staircase. And then, the, uh, sorry, um, that side. Those who want to go this side, uh, then they don't have this, okay? <laughs> God bless you. Huh? God bless you. Welcome to APTS, the premier Pentecostal school of the Asia-Pacific region. The think tank of Pentecostal belief and conviction. even what it took for them to be able to come here to be equipped for the work of ministry. 
some of the alumni that are from my country that uh, who are currently in ministry and how they perform and do in ministry that really encouraged me. So I wanted to really come here and study also. APTS has been helping me and preparing me for my future ministry. To participate in the ongoing mission of Jesus and a, a true desire to become more effective ministers through its spiritually based activities and uh, biblically based courses. The evening program, I've learned a lot, but I missed out during the, my pastoral ministry. Now I can go into it so that, you know, I can go home when I'm done to do better. The PhD program in APTS is very helpful because I can study by myself, stay in my study room and think and write. It was not in my plans to come to APTS. I didn't. I was not 100% sure that I wanted to come. But after being here almost a year and a half, I really thank God for the opportunity of being here. APTS lecturers really prefer us. APTS faculty are more than instructor. They care for me. The scholarship in APTS really big help for us. Help me and my family to fulfill my vision. Meeting so many people from different countries, from different cultural backgrounds. Really, you can meet some wonderful people like who later becomes a part of your life and part of your as a like family. You will not find a better educational program spiritually and financially. APTS is not just about academic programs and beautiful campus. It's about you. If the Lord has called you into ministry, this is the school you should consider. Come and let us turn together. Hi, welcome to APTS, the premier Pentecostal school of the Asia-Pacific region. The think tank of Pentecostal belief and conviction. APTS is small heaven because here we have a lot of students from different countries. Where the church is a, a small minority in the population. And for many of them, just even what it took for them to be able to come here to be equipped for the work of ministry. Some of the alumni that are from my country that uh, who are currently in ministry and how they perform and do in ministry that really encouraged me. So I wanted to really come here and study also. APTS has been helping me and preparing me for my future ministry to participate in the ongoing mission of Jesus and a, a true desire to become more effective ministers through its spiritually based activities and uh, biblically based courses. The evening program, I've learned a lot, but I missed out during the, my pastoral ministry. Now I can go into it so that, you know, I can go home when I'm done to do better. The PhD program in APTS is very helpful because I can study by myself, stay in my study room and think and write. It was not in my plans to come to APTS. I didn't. I was not 100% sure that I wanted to come. But after being here almost a year and a half, I really thank God for the opportunity of being here. APTS lecturers really pray for us. APTS faculty are more than instructor. They care for me. The scholarship in APTS is really big help for us. Help me and my family to fulfill my vision. Meeting so many people from different countries, from different cultural backgrounds. Really, you can meet some wonderful people like who later becomes a part of your life and part of your as a like family. You will not find a better educational program spiritually and financially. APTS is not just about academic programs and beautiful campus. It's about you. If the Lord has called you into ministry, this is the school you should consider. Come and let us journey together with you.
Hi, welcome to APTS, the premier Pentecostal school of the Asia-Pacific region. The think tank of Pentecostal belief and conviction. APTS is small heaven because here we have a lot of students from different countries. Where the church is a, a small minority in the population. And for many of them, just even what it took for them to be able to come here to be equipped for the work of ministry. Some of the alumni that are from my country that uh, who are currently in ministry and how they perform and do in ministry that really encouraged me. So I wanted to really come here and study also. APTS has been helping me and preparing me for my future ministry. To participate in the ongoing mission of Jesus. And a, a true desire to become more effective ministers. Through its spiritually based activities and uh, biblically based courses. The Divin program, I've learned a lot, but I missed out during the, my pastoral ministry. Now I can go into it so that, you know, I can go home when I'm done to do better. The PhD program in APTS is very helpful because I can study by myself, stay in my study room and think and write. It was not in my plans to come to APTS. I didn't. I was not 100% sure that I wanted to come. But after being here almost a year and a half, I really thank God for the opportunity of being here. APTS lecturers really pray for us. APTS faculty are more than instructor. They care for me. The scholarship in APTS is really big help for us, help me and my family to fulfill my vision. Meeting so many people from different countries, from different cultural backgrounds. Really, you can meet some wonderful people like who later becomes a part of your life and part of your as a like family. You will not find a better educational program spiritually and financially. APTS is not just about academic programs and beautiful campus. It's about you. If the Lord has called you, you should consider. Come and let us journey together with you. Hi, welcome to APTS, the premier Pentecostal school of the Asia-Pacific region. The think tank of Pentecostal belief and conviction. APTS is small heaven because here we have a lot of students from different countries. Where the church is a, a small minority in the population. And for many of them, just even what it took for them to be able to come here to be equipped for the work of ministry. Some of the alumni that are from my country that uh, who are currently in ministry and how they perform and do in ministry that really encouraged me. So I wanted to really come here and study also. APTS has been helping me and preparing me for my future ministry. To participate in the ongoing mission of Jesus. And a, a true desire to become more effective ministers. Through its spiritually based activities and uh, biblically based courses. The Divin program, I've learned a lot, but I missed out during the, my pastoral ministry. Now I can go into it so that, you know, I can go home when I'm done to do better. The PhD program in APTS is very helpful because I can study by myself, stay in my study room and think and write. It was not in my plans to come to APTS. I didn't. I was not 100% sure that I wanted to come. But after being here almost a year and a half, I really thank God for the opportunity of being here. APTS lecturers really pray for us. APTS faculty are more than instructor. They care for me. The scholarship in APTS is really big help for us, help me and my family to fulfill my vision. Meeting so many people from different
Hi, welcome to APTS, the premier Pentecostal school of the Asia-Pacific region. The think tank of Pentecostal belief and conviction. APTS is small heaven because here we have a lot of students from different countries. Where the church is a, a small minority in the population. And for many of them, just even what it took for them to be able to come here to be equipped for the work of ministry. Some of the alumni that are from my country that uh, who are currently in ministry and how they perform and do in ministry that really encouraged me. So I wanted to really come here and study also. APTS 